Hello, everybody. We have reached the end of chapter three, except for that last section, which we are about to cover, section 3.9. You see, we save the best until the last. So in this last section of chapter three, we are going to learn how to differentiate exponential and logarithmic functions. And of all the things you have seen, this is probably the most elegant, the most beautiful, the most outstanding uh, derivation. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I will, as I always have whenever I give this, uh, when I, whenever I gave this lesson. So let's get started on exponential and logarithmic functions. Okay, so to conclude uh, chapter three on methods of differentiation, we are going to now um, handle or differentiate exponential and log logarithmic functions. Um, uh, a little bit of a, um, a disclaimer here, the way I explain this material and my notes here uh, in for section 3.9 will be significantly different from what you find in the uh, textbook, the OpenStax book. And that's because I uh, take a, a completely different approach from uh, what this book and most other books do. Uh, personally, I prefer my method, of course, that's why I'm doing this, but I think it's uh, more elegant. And um, I think this is going to be really, really cool. And in fact, it's much easier to understand uh, in my opinion. All right, so first I want you to remember this number which I have been referring to as my favorite number personally, but uh, objectively probably the most important of all real numbers. And it is lowercase e. E stands for a certain constant, okay? And this is defined as the limit as n approaches infinity of one plus one over n to the nth power. Okay, now hold on just for a moment. As n goes to infinity, what's going to happen? Well, as n goes to infinity, this thing, approaches zero, right? I mean, it gets smaller and smaller. So that is easy to understand. So what happens is this base number of the exponential expression, you know, this parentheses to the nth power, the base number gets closer and closer to one. And in fact, from the positive direction. So it'll be like, you know, like 1.2, 1.1, 1.01. And when n is a thousand, this is going to be 1.001. .001. And of course, if you raise one to any higher power, it's still going to be one, all right? So the inside of this, the quantity inside wants to stay small. You get that? You know, because one to the any power is going to be one. But of course, as n goes to infinity, the exponent goes to infinity. Now, if you take 1.01 to a very, very large number like that, this number is actually going to be uh, very large. Okay, so regardless of what this number is, as, as long as that number is bigger than one, raising that to a power that gets bigger and bigger, you know, as n goes to infinity, will eventually uh, approach infinity. So this thing, the exponent, wants the quantity to uh, go to infinity. I hope you understand this, right? So the inside wants to stay small. This I call the Peter Pan phenomenon, okay? You know, Peter Pan refuses to grow and, um, you know, you don't wanna uh, grow up to be adult, an adult. You just want to stay as a child. So the inside wants to stay as one. Outside wants to stretch it. This is the force of the society. No, you do need to grow up. And so what's gonna happen if you want to stay as a child and if the society demands that you grow up? Uh, in this case, it turns out and this is really incredible. It turns out they approach a compromise, right? Uh, so what happens if the inside wants to stay as one, outside wants to make this into an infinitely large number? The compromise turns out to be this number, which is irrational. Oh, so, sorry. Let me just say this in Japanese because that's how I remember this. It's nitenaiyatsu hayani Okay, forget what I just said. You didn't hear what I said. Um, this is, I think, maybe, I don't know how many digits, but um, this is the beginning of the infinite sequence of numerals, which represents this number E. It is irrational. It is not even an algebraic number. It's called a transcendental number because you cannot get this 
transcendental number. Uh, you can't get this by uh, algebraic operations such as squaring and taking square roots of integers, all right? Why is this so important? Okay, by the end of this lesson, you will discover how and why this is the most natural thing to use as the base of an exponential function and logarithmic functions. By the way, uh, this is called E. It's uh, named after a mathematician, a Swiss mathematician named uh, Leonard, Leonard Euler. And uh, he has done a tremendous work related to this E and many other numbers and many other um, fields of mathematics. Okay. All right, so here we have this function log of X, which is a log base E of X, right? This is called the natural log, a natural logarithm function. Why is this called the natural log? Because this is the most natural number to use as your base, as I see, um, and as you will discover. Okay, so let's take the derivative of y. We have no idea how to do that yet. So the only thing we have is the definition. It's the limit as h approaches zero of the natural log of x plus h minus the natural log of x divided by h. Is there anything I can do? Conjugate, cancellation, not really, right? But there is something you can do with the log. You have the difference of two logarithms and that would be the log of, not the difference, but the quotient, remember that? Okay, so then you can write this as the log of actually, yeah, let me go ahead and write this as one over h. I'm going to write um, the denominator h in the front as one over h times the log of one, sorry. Um, I did something wrong, didn't I? This is supposed to be uh, X, okay? Yeah, that's this X here. All right, so this will be one plus H over X. Okay, so now in um, absence of anything else you can do really, um, I can move this one over H to the end as an exponent. This is another thing, a strange thing I can do in uh, with lo logarithms. The a times the log of, you know, a times the log of, uh, uh, I'm not saying this right, a times the log of x happens to be log of x to the eighth power, all right? And that's what I'm using. Um, so I am right now using this as an exponent. And now you see that as a, as a superscript, right? Okay, so, so far, all I did is to sort of do algebraic manipulation. Uh, it doesn't seem to really lead us to anything. Maybe we'll just have to abandon this approach and try to do something else. Well, um, remember I have the definition of E, but this is quite different from that one, but that's okay. Here's what we do. We do this um, method called substitution. We do this a lot in mathematics, as you already know, right? We substitute something for something else. Uh, what I'm going to do is, you see this? I have one over n here, and I don't have one over n, but I can make that into a one over n by introducing n in, in a clever way. So I'm going to let n be the reciprocal of this thing. What do we mean by that? All right, so let n be x over h. Now remember, um, at this point, we are trying to find the derivative of y, which is the natural log of x. So x is, you know, some uh, variable, but for the, um, the purpose of finding the derivative, x is, you know, some fixed number x, right? And what's different, what, what's changing here under this limit is h, which is approaching zero. So let n uh, uh, be equal to x over h, then, of course, h over x, which is you, what you see here, is going to be the reciprocal, which is one over n, right? Now, as h approaches zero, this is approaching zero, right? And just for right now, let's assume this is approaching zero from the positive direction, then n is actually going to infinity, okay? Oh, by the way, x is positive, just because um, only the positive numbers are in the domain of the uh, natural log function or any log function, right? So X is positive, 
you divide that by a very, very small positive number, then n approaches infinity. So that is good. Now, how about one over h? You notice here, from this, you can say h, well, what, what can you say? Uh, you can say h times n is x, that's the cross multiplication, right? And so h is um, x over n. All right, so with all the substitution, this limit becomes this. Now watch this carefully, this is, the, uh, cr the critical um, step in the derivation of the deri uh, derivation of the derivative of um, the natural log function. Uh, instead of h approaching zero, see, I'm going to stop using h. I'm going to stick to n and x. So h is approaching zero, but remember, this means n is going to infinity. And then you have the natural log of one plus, and then x over sorry, h over x is now called one over n, right? And then one over h is, what is one over h? I didn't write it down. One over h is actually x, n over x. So you take the reciprocal. And so this becomes n over x, all right? Um, what I want to, the reason for this substitution is because I want to bring up this e. See, the thing is you have something that looks very much like e, and in fact, you do. If you rewrite it this way and you raise it to the nth power, that's of course not true because you have this one over x in here, but you can rewrite um, this expression this way. Now, remember the log of something to the power of something, you can move that to the front. So it's one over x times the natural log of one plus one over n to the nth power. All right, now this part is not going to, or it does not involve n. So I can move that to the front, okay? And now you have the limit of the log, but log function is continuous. So I can even move this limit to inside of this. And uh, the limit of the log function is the log of the limit. So limit, oh, sorry. I was going to say it's the natural log of the limit as n approaches infinity oops, infinity of one, oops, okay, infinity of one plus one over n to the n. Now we recognize this thing exactly as that number e, okay? So this turns out to be one over x times the natural log of e. Now, what is the natural log, which is log base e of e? Uh, you, you don't need to have a calculator for this, I hope. Right. The question is e to what power is e? And the answer, it's one because e to the x and the natural log of x is the inverse of each other. And also you just know that e to the first is equal to e, right? So this happens to be just one. So the derivative of the natural log function turns out to be nothing more than the reciprocal function one over x. What a surprise, right? Because this number, I mean, look, uh, the natural log, this is a weird uh, thing. First of all, it's a logarithm. It's, that, that's complicated enough. And then somebody told you, we are going to take this irrational transcendental number E, which you can't even write the whole thing uh, as the base. But it turns out it is the natural choice, partly most natural choice, partly because its derivative is very simple, one over X. Okay, the reciprocal function is the derivative of the natural log function. Now you may not see all the glory hidden in this equation that uh, not the derivative of ln of x is equal to one over x. And, um, but soon you will see how powerful, how important, how uh, relevant this is in many, many types of applications. All right, so, uh, put down the date when you learn this, because that will be a, a significant date in your entire life. Okay, so that is the derivative of the natural log function. All right, maybe I should write this as number one uh, here. Okay, we have discovered this. The second one, the second one is going to be very, very simple. E is equal to, uh, well, sorry, y is equal to e to the x. That is the inverse function, right? Uh, it is the 
um, inverse of the natural log function. It's e to the x exponential. Let's take the derivative. All right, so to do this, again, this is very different from the way um, the book describes it. The book actually does this first and then goes back to uh, the natural law. What is its derivative? Okay, now if you know the answer, I mean, <laughs> once you know the answer, you will never forget this, right? Um, let's, um, let's take the, 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 the log, let's do logarithmic differentiation. This becomes log of y is equal to x. That's exactly the same statement, right? Assuming that, uh, well, x could be any real number at this point. Now we're going to do the implicit differentiation, which is one over y times y prime. Remember this becomes one over y times the derivative of the y, which is y prime, is, ex is actually the derivative of x, which is one. So what did I say y prime was? It's y, which is e to the x. Wait, did I make a mistake? Um, I took the derivative, I differentiated this, but I didn't come up with anything different. Uh, but that's, that's okay. That's what the mathematics tells us. And the mathematics is not going to lie to you. <laughs> All right, the derivative of e to the x, where, you know, again, that irrational transcendental number is the base of this exponential function turns out to be itself. It is the only function that has this property, y prime is equal to y or y prime minus y is equal to zero. Well, when I say this is the only function, I mean it and it's constant multiple. All right, so three times e to the x has the same property. 27 times e to the x has the same property. Zero, the constant zero, which is zero times this has the same property as well. But it really is essentially the only function whose derivative is uh, itself, okay? Uh, you know what the second derivative of this is? Second derivative of this is the derivative of the first derivative, which is e to the x. So this is e to the x. Um, uh, what's the, you know, the hundredth derivative of this function? Oops, that's two here. Uh, of e to the x is going to be e to the x, okay? So no matter how many times you differentiate this, e to the x is not going to change. Sort of immutable in a sense, it's never going to change no matter how much you try to change it. Well, that's a powerful statement, isn't it? Okay, um, yes. All right, so <clears throat> maybe you should try to verify this. You know what the log, natural log function looks like? X has to be, you know, uh, positive, right? Here's a point, uh, one, zero. Now remember, the derivative is one over x. So if you take the tangent line here, okay, this tangent line at one is going to have the slope one over one, which is one. And that is the slope of this tangent line. And as x approaches infinity, of course, the slope gets uh, smaller and smaller and approaches zero, which is consistent with this graph, right? Okay, so uh, let's do an example here. What is um, the derivative? Let's differentiate this. Y is equal to e to the three x, okay? What's the derivative then? It's e to the blob times the derivative of the three x part, the blob part, which is three, okay? So get used to that. This is again, I didn't say that, but it's obviously uh, what rule did I just use? the power, no, I'm sorry, the, uh, the chain rule. What happens if you have e to the x to the fourth, okay? Then y prime is e to the blob, so you have e to the x fourth times four x cubed, or you can rewrite this as four x cubed e to the x to the fourth. All right, so that's how um, the chain rule works on these. All right, I want to try, I want to ask you this. Let's say y1 is the natural log of 2x, y2 is the natural log of 13x, y3 uh, is the natural log of kx, where k is any real number bigger than one. All right, what's the derivative of this? Go ahead and try to find the derivatives of all of these. Pause the video and come back when you are done.
Okay, so <clears throat> you may have just said this, the derivative is clearly the reciprocal one over two X. But if you said that, you have forgotten that this itself is an inside function. So that, uh, so you have to multiply this answer by the derivative of the inside function. And you get one over X. Somehow two just didn't appear. Okay, this is the same thing here. It gives you 13 X in the denominator, but then you have to multiply it by the derivative of the top or the inside function, which is 13. That's also one over X. Oh, wait, what? Okay, how about this one? Last one, the denominator is KX. The derivative of the inside function is K. And because K is not zero, this makes sense. You can cancel. So you get the same derivative, no matter what that K is. Uh, what? What is going on? Well, remember, oops. What is log of KX? It is the log of K plus log of X. And guess what? This is a constant. So when you have a, a constant term, it disappears, right? So it turns out K doesn't matter. Whatever K is, the derivative will still be the same. That is a little strange, I know, but it, you know that's mathematics. Okay, uh, let's do uh, differentiate this. Let, let's give, uh, here's another example. Y is the natural log of X cubed minus two. Can you take the derivative of this? I think you can, right? And it will be one over the blob, which is x cubed minus three, uh, well, x cubed minus two. And then you multiply this according to the power, uh, the product, according to the chain rule, um, multiply this by the derivative of the inside function, three x squared. So this is three x squared over x squ uh, cubed minus two. All right, not hard at all. Okay, so, but this gives us a wonderful way to differentiate log and exponential functions. Here's another one. This is number one, that's number two. This is also very cool. Let's say you have the log of the uh, secant of X. Secant, remember, is one over cosecant. Uh, so one over uh, and uh, cosine, right? Okay, so what happens when you do that? Well, you get one over the, the, the inside function, one over the blob, which is secant of X. And then you multiply this by the derivative of the inside function. What is the derivative of secant? It's secant tangent. All right, this crosses out. Wait, is that right? Yes, the derivative of the natural log of secant happens to be tangent. Now, later on, when you go into integral calculus, you will discover that uh, many times you have to go backwards. You have to not differentiate, but find the function whose derivative is the given function. So at that point, and that's called the, an antiderivative, by the way, uh, you will find that the antiderivative of tangent of X happens to be the natural log of the secant of X. By the way, um, what happens if, um, if you think of this as one over cosine of X, that's the same thing, right? Okay, are you gonna get the same tangent function as the derivative? Yeah, uh, you will. Okay, so the reason is because you can rewrite this as cosine of X, the negative one, right? Okay, but if this is, well, I don't even have to have these parentheses. Uh, remember the minus one as an exponent can come in front. So it's negative natural log of cosine of X. And so that would be negative. And um, the denominator will be the, outside, the inside function. And then the numerator will be the derivative of this inside function, which is going to be negative sine of x. And lo and behold, you have negative, negative of sine over cosine, which is the positive tangent x function. Yes, so you do get the same answer making you feel great, all right? Um, one more thing here before we go to the second part or the segment of this section on video, uh, what happens if you have a natural log of cosecant of X? It should be similar to this number two, right? 
Uh, yeah, it should be, all right? So the denominator is cosecant of x because remember natural log of the blob becomes one over the blob. And then the top is the derivative of the cosecant function, which is negative cosecant cotangent. Okay, so you can cross out these and the answer turns out to be negative cotangent of x. Oof, that's awesome. All right, uh, we are going to do, see what happens, see I have just used E, this very weird number, which of course I am telling you as the most important real number, but we use this strange looking number as the base of your exponential and log functions. What if you used another, um, you know, more convenient looking number such as 10 or two or something like that? That's what's going to be covered in the next segment.